So good morning, uh, Nurse Olive. You look as beautiful as always. Good to see you. Good morning, Gabriel. Thank you very much. Good to see you too. Well, indeed, I said to Sean, you know, we need to go ahead and do a subscription so we can send you up as a combined Miss Dominica, Miss Jamaica 2022. <laughs> You look as beautiful as I first saw you when I was 15 years old in 1976. I came okay. to your home at Zikak Portsmouth. Mike was eating a fish broth and I came in with Rosie. And, um, you know, uh, Mike asked who I was and I told him who, you know, I, 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 I sometimes wonder, uh, Aunt Olive, when I was a, a child, literally 15, 16 years old, I would come to your home and spent uh, several nights at your home during the independence movement when your husband was a minister of government. Why, when I reflect as an adult, how my parents allowed me to sleep out of the house and I'm in fifth form, sixth form and so on. And then it makes sense. My father had known my experience before he was born during the early days of World War II, when his brother Lemuel Christian, the musician was then a Portsmouth based police officer. But more than that, he had been the fire, chief fire officer in Portsmouth on several occasions um, with Corbett and, and Severe and his fire officers. And he was the younger brother of H.L. Christian, who was in the cabinet with Mike. So it all made sense. But when you're a child, you know, you don't think about all those connections, you know. So, so um, it's good to see you. And this morning, we are honored to have you. Uh, we will uh, interview you for what we hope will be a program on Victory One Television, which is a live streaming TV. But I will also use the material from this interview for a essay on your life, a biographical essay, because on Monday, I received from your um, niece, Debbie Douglas, some photographs of yourself at the uh, Nurse Olive Douglas uh, Community Health Center in Portsmouth, which was named after you by the government of Dominica. And the prime minister, of course, uh, Roosevelt Scarlett is there with you. And I said to myself, I don't think I've seen an uh, essay on you. And you've been such an instrumental person in Portsmouth alongside your husband, Mike Douglas, and later your brother-in-law, Rosie Douglas, and now your son, Ian Douglas. But your work has always been of a non-partisan nature. It has been as a nursing professional, um, teaching nurses, running the hospital and the like. And I thought it was important for your story to be told because many Dominicans at home and abroad don't know your story. And your story is really not only a story of nation building, you're a true nation builder, but your, uh, your story is one of Caribbean integration because you were born in Jamaica. So I'm going to start with your early years in Jamaica and then your migration to England, coming to Dominica in the 70s, meeting Mike in England and so forth. Your mother, your mothering of several children and your, your uh, you know, when I came to meet, when I met you first, people didn't call you by your name, you know, they just called you nurse. You know, the nurse was, was, was Olivia. In fact, I used to call you Olive, Miss Olive, but your name is actually Olivia. So give me, give us your full name. Tell us where you were born and when you were born. Okay, Gabriel. But let me back up a little bit more. For the first time when I get to meet you, when you came to the house, I thought this tall young man, I thought you looked to be, you know, one of... Mike's brothers, but the, face, the facial features did not match up. And it was long after because there were so many things to see and to do, you know, but all was welcome at the home as long as they were brought there by Mike. And of course, I, at that time, I was still settling down, still getting to, um, you know, acclimatize with the people and the place, which it took me a very long time to settle down, I can assure you. Also, too, this is my second story, because sometime in 2013, I did my story with Dr. Valda Henry for the Phenomenal Women. I'm sure you must know uh, of Valda, and, and yeah. she runs yes. that program. I have never missed one year, and I think we celebrated 10 years last year, this yes. year. Yes. yes, so this is, but at that time, my story was the wife of a politician. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So Today, to... we capture a lot more than, than what I did for Valda. Yes, indeed. That, um, that was a very, that is a very good program that Valda is doing. And um, 
you know, I would wish that a lot of women would afford themselves to this convention when it comes around, it's annual, because there's so much to gain, so much experience by others. Um, this past January, Dr. Hazel Schillingford did her story. And I'm telling you, it was really, really enlightening and worth learning because she too comes from, uh, I think St. Joseph, a very humble background. Yes. And uh, right now is one that is really respected and she's doing a tremendous service for our people here in Dominica. Indeed, outstanding. So, this is the second story. Well, I just want to, I'm listening to you and I said to myself, I, I know that you're a fantastic nurse, but you will also be a good newscaster because you have very good diction. So uh, this is going to be very enjoyable. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's fun you said about um, one of Mike's brothers because several people later on, you know, thought I looked a bit like Rusey. You know, because I guess I was, you know, as I got older. Um, yes, I remember that time very well. So, so tell me, uh, a nurse, uh, uh, where, give us your date of birth. I was born on the 4th of April. My mother told me it was a Good Friday, 1941. Outstanding. And uh, where were you born? I was born in a small uh, community in St. Thomas, uh, about three miles from the main town of Morant Bay called Johnstown. Johnstown, and that's, that's uh, St. Thomas, Jamaica. That's right. Outstanding. And you know, I said to you earlier, I was so fascinated that you were born so close to Morant Bay because I um, consider the Morant Bay uprising of 1865 and the role of Paul Bogle and George William Gordon to be formative in my political maturation because that was an uprising for justice by Jamaican people, which was put down by the British Army, and um, it was put down quite brutally, and it, it, it really heightened my anti-colonial consciousness, because before that, I think I looked at the British Army a little differently because my father had served. But tell us about your parents. Give us your mother's name and your father's name. Well, my mother, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, she was, um, her maiden name was, uh, I can't quite remember now her, her maiden name, but my father was Alfred Bryan, and my father was much older than my mother. Uh, in those days, Sanderson, my mother was Elizabeth Sanderson. That's right. And uh, my mother was one of 12 children. My grandmother had 12 children. And it was very difficult. My mother was born in St. Elizabeth, both parents. My father was born in, in St. Elizabeth, Black River. And my mother was born also in, and raised and grew up in St. Elizabeth, Watch Well. Well, my mother was the fourth of, 12, of the 12 children. Yeah. So my aunt, who was called Violet, and we call her Vi Vi. She had to leave home early in search of work. Uh, and she happened to arrive, I, I'm not quite sure of the story there, in St. Thomas, where she was working for um, the British people. In those days, they were called Bakra people. And uh, she got a job there. Uh, in this house, she was responsible. She was the main housekeeper. So after a while, she sent for my mother, who was much younger, of course, and got her job too. So while my mother was left school very early and, and joined my aunt, and while there, the story my mother said was, my father now, who used to be a trader in... Um, in animals, in cows particularly. He used to take cows from St. Elizabeth and trained uh, in um, getting trade to St. Thomas. And these people for whom my aunt used to work, they had cows. So, you know, these cows, they were milk and, 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 and you know, the milk sold to the local hospitals and things like that. So my father, who had seen my mother several times and tried to make a break 
so we, you know, speak. Yes. As a matter of fact, my mother said, she told him, you are too old, you were supposed to go and join the church and ring the bell. <laughs> That's funny. Said, how, old, how old would your mother have been at that time? My mother would be um, about 18 at that time. I see. Yeah. And, and, and your father would have been how old at that time? My father would have been, I think, 40. Okay. He was much, much older. Now, she said the very, the very um, owners or the, the, the people who owned the house and the background, all these white men, they were making a pass at her and she was feeling terribly uncomfortable. Now, far away from home, St. Elizabeth, St. Thomas, and there was, you know, hardly anyone to hear her story. And as a young person, who could she talk to? I don't think my aunt would believe any of the stories if she would tell her. So she said she prayed because my mother was Baptist, they were raised as Baptist. So she prayed about it. And she said, you know what? I think I'd better answer that man instead of you know, going and make children for these white men. And um, at least my father, the man at that time, had, were able or would have been able to support her and her children when the time comes. So she said the next time he, you know, he talked to her, and so she decided she would marry him. Okay. So <laughs> That's she interesting. Got married, yeah, she got married to him, and um, between them, they were, they had eight of us. Okay. Give give us the names of the, years. give us the names of the oldest to the youngest. The oldest was my brother Richard who has since passed away, he went to England very early. Um, and, and the second was my sister, who is Lavina. And she's now, she was in England. She went to England, did nursing. And now she's back in, in Jamaica. Whenever I go to Jamaica, I stayed with her. She's 84 years old. Oh, bless her. Uh, then my sister, Joanne, who is now in Florida as a retired nurse too. And then there's Richard, Lavina, Joanne, and myself, the fourth in that line. Two, two children passed away um, at a very early age. So fourth was myself, Olivia, and uh, my brother, Lennox, came after me. He was born in 1945, and he's now home and take care of most of my sister's needs, like shopping and stuff like that. And then my last brother, who is living somewhere in Belize, uh, he was the last, and he was born in 1951. What's his name? His name is Robin, Robin Bryan. So I have, I have Richard. I have Lavinia, yes. I have That's Joanne. Right. Yes. Is it Joanne or Joanna? Joanne. Joanne, I yes. have Olivia, I have yes. Lennox, I have Robin. That's correct. So one, two, three, four, five, six. That's Am I correct. Missing? Okay. Two, two passed away at very early age, soon after birth. I see, okay. All right. Um, so tell me, um, what did your father do for a living? My father, he, he did farming. I see. A very not very big farming like we would look at today, but small farming and fishing. I and he, he did trading in animal, cows and goats. And, you know, he would take these from St. Elizabeth mm -hmm. to St. Thomas and trade them. Okay. Describe your living circumstances. You know, you had your own home in the countryside. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, as, as I said, we were born, you know, small, this house was made like what we have here now. They call it Kulme. Yes. You have people who have experience in building. Yes. So this, um, my father was able to erect a, a small house. There was a room in it for himself and his wife and one for the boys. And each of the girls would have theirs. Uh, he used to say so that when you grow up, 
and you know you run into difficulty in marriage or whatever don't stay in it i can remember my father says there is a room for each of you particularly you girls you each have a room to this day i think the whole house is there um, yes. my brother lives there now so um you know and my mother my mother stayed home took care of the children uh, she was very, very busy and occupied doing com community work, voluntary. She and she was very faithful to her church until the day she died. How so, old was she when she passed away? My mother was ninety-one when she passed. Outstanding, outstanding. Yes. And what about your father? My father, I can't remember very much because my father passed away when I was ten years old. I see. He had um, hypertension and he had stroke twice that I can remember. And the third time he did not recover. Okay. And in that, in those days, the, the, there was no health center in my community. And there was only the hospital, which was in the town. And of course I said there was at least three hours away. Uh, you know, and it would be difficult by the time the ambulance would, someone would have to go on foot down to the hospital to request the ambulance. Um, telecommunication was very, um, was almost non-existent. Yeah. So, you know. Well, let me, let me ask you this, um, Ms. Olive. What were the sort of, um, tell us about the communal activities, you know, in Dominica, for instance, the communal activity, the biggest one is carnival. But I don't think in Jamaica in those days there was carnival. So what did you do to enjoy yourselves? Uh, I guess you had Christmas, you had Easter. Tell us, please. As young people, all our energy and effort and activities was geared towards the church. Sunday school, young people, convention. That was how the community was. Outside of the community, you were looked upon as I would say maybe vagabonds, and um, you were not allowed to play or go out, you know, in the home and family circle were there your concentration for, you know, activities and, and, and relationships. We'd play ring games, we would, you have to get your books. You know, morning, noon, and night, you were expected to be in your books. Let's talk about that, Ms. Olive, because um, with seniors of your generation, my generation, education was foremost. That's foremost. Right. Tell That's us about right. the role of education in your home and in your community. Yes, when growing up at the age of 10, I was a member of the Girl Guide. Um, actually, we form a guard of honor at the hospital, which was when Princess Margaret came. To, the, to Jamaica to open that new hospital. Um, there was this guard of honor, the hospital to this may, may is named after her, Princess Margaret. So you had the guides and brownies, which of course was run by English um, volunteers who were very plentiful in Jamaica at the time. And you had to form a guard of honor. So I was involved in the girl guiding I was involved in um, 4-H. 4-H was another big activities for young people. And uh, at the age of 12, when you do the, what they call common entrance, and in those days it's selection, I was fortunate enough to have gained a place in the high school, but this was in another parish in Portland. And my father objected. Now, when my father went away on one of his trading trips, my mother sent me to live with my uncle in this other parish so that I could access the secondary education. The high school was Happy Grove High School. Mm. On return, maybe a month later, my father was very upset. He said, my girls do not leave my home. My girls remain at my home. I know I've had experience. So he duly came straight over to Portland, packed up my things and brought me back to St. Thomas Johnstown. Of course, we had a, a, a really, um, a very prominent teacher there. She was Methodist. Her name was Thelma Stewart. 
who had you know, grown up and did very well in the education system. She wrote many books um, about many books on young people and developmental life. Actually, when she knew I was in Jamaica, she made a presentation of a couple of these books so that I could use them in, in the work I was doing. So he brought me back to, to Johnstown under the mentorship and back into the seventh standard. We had seventh standard at that time. And when you're in seventh standard at that time, you were able to do the first, second, and third Jamaica local examination. Mm. Now, Miss Stewart, as we referred to her, was very strict, very well brought up. She was from this parish of St. Catherine. Yeah. And therefore, she really mentored all the young girls, you know, that was in that standard seven at the time. You were not allowed to eat on the street. You were not allowed to sit on steps. You, whenever you're walking with, you know, young men or young boys of our age, you're not allowed to hold hands. Uh, you know, and a lot of those things that was for, I can remember once um, we had after school because school was from eight until four with of course lunch break and, you know, break in between coffee, not coffee break because you were not allowed to drink coffee but we had a lot of juice and so recess break we would say. And um, she came, she was absent for the day but she came back early for whatever reason. And there we were, we had lessons to prepare but we sat on a lovely bit of grass. We, we had do a lot of, the boys were responsible for agriculture and the upkeep of the schoolyard. And we, the girls, were involved in home economics, which include washing, ironing, baking. Up to this day, I can do my own Jamaican bun that I yes. learned. Yes. <laughs> yes. Bun and cheese. Bun and when cheese. She, yes. When she arrived, she found us sitting with the boys. We were eating cod fish, salt fish, and crackers. Mm. And she was really upset. She brought all the girls up to houses were built then for the principal, which she was the head teacher, up to her room. And she gave us a lecture, you know, about being ladies and this kind of things. To this day, I can I feel very embarrassed if I have to eat on the road. Yes, of course. <laughs> it was very common in my time too that you're a lot, you're not supposed to curse. You're not supposed to eat on the road, you know, and those those things have gone away now. Uh, and uh, one of the concerns that I will raise with you later is the um, high use of alcohol by our young people. And in general, you know, they, there's just too much alcohol use on Dominica. Great concern, because when I was growing up on Dominica, young people didn't drink alcohol. You know, you had vagrants, you know, people who were in the street. I mean, maybe have a little alcohol around festive seasons, a little wine, but now alcohol use seems to be very commonplace. And I'd like to have your thoughts on why it is that we have such a high use of alcohol in Dominica. But let's get back. But you may want to comment on that now, and then I'll get back to Jamaica before you left for England. Yes, back in my days, I, before I left, my first taste of alcohol was in England. And Mike asked me out and he had wine. I was really embarrassed. I didn't even know how to drink the wine. The first maybe two sips, I already maybe tell myself consciously that I was drunk <laughs> because I never saw alcohol in my mother's house. Yes, yes. And, um, and my brothers, you were not allowed as young people growing up, they had what they call bars. And these bars would have like an inner door and an outside door. So these are closed. So young people were never seen in bars buying alcohol or drinking alcohol. Yes. Um, as I said, my first experience was with alcohol was when I arrived in England. So tell so, me about, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, now when, come to, when I come to Dominica, of course, that's another story. Alcohol was free and in England, you were only 
you only know to drink your learn in, because in nursing school, let me back, back a little bit more. The, the health people, Ministry of Health or who are responsible for nursing education in England at the time, they came to Jamaica to recruit nurses. And of course they came to the country, not to Kings, they were in Kingston, but the recruitment took them up right up to Johnstown where I was. You were asked to attend an interview and they tell you a little bit about nursing in England. And then you had to write an essay of why you want to go to England to do nursing. Uh, my essay, of course, was, you know, I wanted to go because my sister, my eldest sister was there already and used to send down like barrels with lovely clothes and, you know, things you used to see pictures. So, of course, my interest to join her was already heightened. Let me so, ask you, how old were you when you, so at the time the nursing recruiters came from England, how old were you at that time? And this was, I left Jamaica 10 days after my 18th birthday. Amazing. Amazing. Yes. So yes. tell us about the recruitment process, the essay, and your preparations to leave Jamaica. Yes. Well, I had, at that time, I just finished the first and second level education um, in Jamaica. At third level, if you do the third, usually between 19 and so, you would be able to go to school, high school, maybe in Kingston. But my parents are very protective. So I'm not sure whether my mother was, you know, uh, digested the idea of my going to Kingston. However, I think she was very happy and did everything in her powers because my system, both my sisters were in England already. And my going to England, I think, was a dream of hers as well. So this essay, and you, you had to write this essay while these people were there, and it was gave it to the head mistress. She would then, um, well, perhaps correct it or look at it, you know, and say, um, you know, if there was any flaw in it, uh, and and why. My also my other interest for wanting to go to England to do nursing. My aunt Vi Vi used to do what we do now, domestic. She was a domestic worker at the hospital. Actually, she worked in the laundry, make sure the, you know, the sheets and everything. And on holidays and weekends, I used to go down to meet my aunt. I was fascinated by the nurses and the doctors. <laughs> And actually, after one of those episodes, I tried to give the cat. I had a little cat that I was very fond of. And I took a, one of these, what we call, it's a prickle from the lime tree to try to give the cat an injection. Oh. And it, I have this scratch on my leg to this day. And <laughs> kind of practicing, you know? Yes. So, it was kind of in me. Another thing is to, as young people growing up, you have to have a 100% respect for elderly. Don't let someone go and tell my mother you passed and didn't say good morning. Whether yes. you they see you first or you see them after. But that was a kind of community outlook. All yes. the elderly people that I can think of, they used to look out for all the young people growing up. Sometimes they, they don't know what you're talking about. They make up stories uh, that would keep you in line. You yes. know, but when you go home, my mother would say, yes, you were talking to so-and-so. Yes. It is like that. You are not let out me, let me, six let, 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 <laughs> So we're back on the record um, with Olive Douglas, Miss Olivia Douglas of Jamaica, but a true Dominican and Caribbean nation builder. Before you go to the, your departure for England, tell us a little about some of the great personalities in Jamaica that you may have known or have heard about, like Norman Manley, Alexander Bostamante, and tell us about Jamaica was moving now into self-government, where Jamaicans now had the vote. And so you left Jamaica before independence, but tell us a little bit about the political life in Jamaica before you left for England. Well, Gable, um, political life growing up in Jamaica, was really feeling the, how you get involved as a young person was if a, a, a representative would be coming 
to that community. There would be a, a big fanfare. And therefore, you know, you maybe have a guard of honor or something like that. But Sir Alec Bustamante, as I knew him, he was the he was once a premier and he owned a large property in St. Thomas. As a matter of fact, he built a huge house, which is there. my sister who after his, just before his death, and he had already been um, downsizing in politics, uh, a lot of the property was then allotted to people who used to work with him and on, 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 the, on, on his estate, so to speak. So my sister, who later on in life married one of these gentlemen, McCarthy, who was bequeathed the house where he used to live, Bustamante. And as a child growing up in Johnstown, we used to walk from Johnstown to License. That's where his main house was. And I could remember him because he was, he's a white, like a white Englishman with lots of bushy hair and his eyes. So we were kind of afraid of him because I think, you know, our parents shielded us from people like that because they always want to touch you. And you know, at 18, a teenager. You... So that was what I could remember of Bustamante. And of course- um, What about Manley, Norman Manley? Do you... Manley, there was PJ Patterson. Yeah, but PJ Patterson, PJ Patterson came much later. But did you know him as a young man? Um, yes, I met PJ Patterson, perhaps in Dominica, when he oh. came here at some time, but these are the names that, you know, resonates with me. Yes, my, but you don't, you don't Manley, remember, you don't remember Norman Mann. You don't remember Norman Mann. Yes, I, by name. By name. By name, right. And because we were in the country and everything was happening in Kingston, and, you know, St. Mary and those places. And of course you're not allowed even to go on any kind of rally unless you're well chaperoned. Let me ask you a question about the train. In those days, was the train running through St. Yes. Thomas? To, to St. Thomas? Yes, to Moran Bay, I, yes. as far as I can remember. Did yes, you I, take, uh, Did you ever take the train in Jamaica? Yes, once. When I left, it was holiday, and my sister, my sister was going to St. Catherine, a Catholic high school for girls. Uh, she was sent there to one of my uncles and during the Christmas holiday, just to see what Christmas was like outside of St. Thomas, my mother allowed my sister to take care of me while I was down there because she was grown at the time. And for the experience of riding on the train, I think we came from Bog, Bog Walk, which was another um, town. I think Bog Walk was the town capital of St. Mary. I'm not quite sure now, but from St. Catherine, she took me for a train ride and back to Spanish town because she was we, she was living in Spanish town at the time. Let Spanish me ask town, the capital of St. Catherine. Outstanding. Do you remember the, the, the disaster, yes. the train, the train crash at Kendall? Were you in Jamaica at that time when that train crash took place? The train disaster? I can't remember what year, but I can remember it now that you've mentioned it. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, now we're getting ready for you to leave Jamaica. How did you leave Jamaica? Did you go by plane or by boat? Well, of course, when these when we were recruited, there we went by plane. Um, we left it's Norman Manley Airport now. Uh, I can't remember. It's I think it was Palisados, it was Palisados, Palisados Airport before. Right, yes. Yeah. So we left Palisados Airport straight to North Gatwick. Um, Heathrow. 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 There were other recruit young ladies. I, I don't think they were young men, but young ladies too in, for nursing. And I can remember there must have been about six of these red buses 
which came to meet us at the airport. And you were, you know, uh, put on these buses and assigned to these hospitals. So, so when you came to England, you had yes. no training yet? No. All the training would have been given at the hospital? Yes. And what time of year was it? What time of year? Was it winter, summer? Do you know? Do you remember? Well, I think spring. It was, I left home 10 days after my 18th birthday, which was in April. Yes. So the weather, spring was just beginning to set in, you know, flowers were coming up and it was very cold for me. It was very cold, yeah. but it was at that time, it was during spring. So um, you get to the hospital. What hospital did, you, did they bring you to? I went to Coney Hill Hospital. It was a psychiatric hospital, um, but they were doing double training at the time. You arrive there and they give you what you call another test, elementary test to see where your educational level was. And then they would put you into a preliminary nursing course for three months. Depends on your performance, you would be, depends on your performance or how well you, you did in the test or the examination at the end of the preliminary course, you would, either have the choice of doing three years psychiatric nurse and then three years general or four years and complete both training. And when you, when you finished um, nurse, what would you get? Would that be a diploma or would that be a degree? A, a diploma. In nursing? Yes, in nursing. Would you, would, would you have to also, after that diploma, take a licensing test? No, you, yes, you do. Right through, it's built throughout the program. At the end of the program, you do have to do a written test and a practical. And then at the end of that, then you become a registered, licensed or registered nurse. That's right, yes. And, I and you, sorry. I did, both, I did both training in four years. Okay, so you arrived in England in what year? You arrived in England in 1959? 1959. That's right. And when did you graduate from the program at Pony Hill? I graduated four years after that because I did both, both general nursing and registered mental nursing. So, so you graduated I, in 1963? 63. 63? No. I graduated before 63 because Robert was born in 1963. So it's, I graduated 5960, about 62, yes. just before I got married. Outstanding. So um, tell me, you lived in a dormitory at the hospital? Yes, there were homes, nursing homes, uh, housed about, I would say, anywhere between 600 and 1,000 girls and from Britain, 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 Ireland, um, England, Scotland, and the Caribbean, of course. Um, let, let me ask you this. Were the majority or were all the nurses of color, meaning of African descent, from the Caribbean or were they from other places as well? They were from other places as well. Africa. Oh, you had African nurses. You had African yes. nurses. Yes, yes, yes. I was privileged to be a bridesmaid to a very good fr African friend of mine. She was from Nigeria. <laughs> So let me ask you, were the majority, however, of the black nurses from the Caribbean? Yes, that, uh, that was in the hostel where I was living at the time. And did you meet any of the nurses from the Caribbean from other islands? Yes, Trinidad, um, Trinidad, Antigua, and Barbados. Yes, yes. Um, did you meet any Dominican nurses? No. Okay. I didn't know anything about Dominica. It's, it's a long story. My other Jamaican friend, her, her sister was a teacher at the school that recruited us. I so see. while we were on the aircraft, I met her sister, um, Gloria Bonner. And we, you know, struck up a friendship. And her, her boyfriend at the time was from Antigua. And they were in the Royal Air Force. They were recruited and were stationed in Cyprus. Yes. And Mike was in his regiment, I think. 
So, so when you say Mike, you mean your future husband, Michael Douglas. <laughs> yes, Gabriel. He came to the hostel to visit Gloria. I see. And while, you know, Gloria wasn't there. She was absent. She had gone shopping. And so we started to talk. Yes. And when he went back to Cyprus, he told Mike that he had met this Jamaican girl and he would have liked to have engaged in a discussion with her, but his girlfriend was already Jamaican and so. And Mike wrote to me, and of course, I was quite upset that he did give Mike my name and address, you know, the rest is history. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so Mike, without, without even meeting you, the power of your vibration was so strong that he wrote you a letter without, without before meeting you. At my 19th birthday then, it was my 19th or 20th birthday, uh, Mike came to England because I think RBD came to England to represent the Banana Association, I think it was. Yes. Um, and when you say RBD, you mean that's Robert Douglas, the father of Mike Douglas. That's correct. But before that, um, Mike and I will, you know, Mike sent, I, I think Gloria, who told Cliff my birthday. So on my birthday, there was this guy came on a motorcycle with a huge bouquet of flowers yeah. right up to the nurse's hostel for yeah. Miss, Miss, Doug, Miss Brian, I was at the time. And <laughs> What happened after that? No. And that's, and Brian, after, that's Brian, B R Y A N. B R Y A N, yes. And then, of course, you know, it was difficult because I never had a boyfriend and I didn't know how to handle this thing. <laughs> so the, 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 the home sister took the bouquet, brought it to my home, to my room. I was on night duty. And what I did, when she said, Look, it's your birthday. So I said, yes, and there was a little tag in it. I took out the tag and I hid it because I didn't want my girlfriends to come and see. I never told them they didn't know I had a boyfriend or anything, but it wasn't any boyfriend because I, we hadn't met yet. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, Mike was sending you a bouquet of flowers without having met you. That's right. Did he, even, he, was, know, did he even know what you looked like, how beautiful you were? <laughs> Unless he had seen pictures because Gloria was always taking pictures. I see. So when did you first meet Mike? Well, Mike, Mike came to the hostel um, to see me. And, and you could, it, also in England, you just couldn't go, you can come in to see somebody. Uh, but there were rooms in the hostel for visitors. So you were not allowed at any time to go to any, you know, to the rooms of the nurses. So he came. And I couldn't, of course, not, you know, uh, uh, welcome this young man would come to see me, having sent me all those flowers and what have you. That was after my birthday. And while he was there, he was shown into the visitor's room. And coming a long way, I think he was from Cyprus on vacation. I said, would you like a cup of tea or a cup of coffee? And I think he said coffee. And I went to make the coffee. And of course, I was shaking like a leaf. And spill the coffee. And Before I could you, see, be, I so could you see laughing. <laughs> so let me ask a question. How did he look to you? Was he in his uniform of the Royal Air Force? Yes, he was in uniform and he was really handsome. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I don't know if it's the sight of him or making the coffee, which I've never done before. You know, yes. I was really nervous. <laughs> yes. So he had the, the blue uniform, the cap, and everything. Yes, kind of light green. green. I think it's light blue, light blue. Light, light blue. Yes, yes. So, 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 um, uh, the, so from the moment you met him, was that was it a done deal, or did it still have to work? No, it still had to work because <laughs> I just, you know, the, the emotions were going, and I keep saying to myself, I wish I hadn't met him. You know, I, I, as a matter of fact, I got vexed with my friend because it's she who, you know. Her, her boyfriend who struck up this thing and I, I and I didn't really have any idea I couldn't talk to my sister about it I wasn't there for that I was there to do my nursing however he called up 
and he invited me out to see this show, The Swiss Family Robinson. Mm -hmm. You've read the book, I suppose. Yes, yes. And he said, if you don't agree, I will come to the hospital and I will say to the matron, I will ask her permission to take you. And that I didn't want him to see the matron because, you know, the matron would tell my sister. And so I said, okay, we'll meet. So we decided, I decided, yes, I'll, I'll go on the train. Halfway taking the train from Bexley, uh, I decided, no, I'd better go back. I'm not quite sure. However, I persisted. And he was in Lewisham because I think he had family living in Lewisham at the time. And that's where he was going to take me to see this movie. So we arrived on the platform and I arrived on the platform and I decided to turn back to take the next train back. And this young man came, he was wearing a red sweater, tall sleeve, and my goodness. He said, excuse me, I am supposed to meet a young lady coming off this train. Did you see any, was there another young lady of color on the train with you? I said, I can't, I don't know, I didn't see anyone. He said, but I think you are the young lady. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Mike. <laughs> Yes, I said no. He said yes because you're shaking. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he remembered the first time. <laughs> and, and after that, you know, we went to the movie and he escorted me back to the hostel and, you know, the rest is history. We and lost my on the 20th of January, 1962. 20th of January, 1962. Yes. And when was, when was your first uh, son, Robert, born? Uh, Robert was born on the 6th of August, 1963. Okay, very good. So, Mike, uh, did he stay in the Air Force or did he leave and go to college around that time? Uh, he was in the Air Force and we had a little bit of, you know, it became very stressful because I had just finished my exam and I wanted to do midwifery and, um, you know, a baby on the way baby was born and he was always being transferred from one place to the other by the Royal Air Force. And which means most of the time I would be on my own. I have nurse friends who would come and support me and things like that. So at one stage, as, as Robert grew older, I said, no, I can't deal with this. Although there were um, accommodation provided for you, uh, but he was losing all his friends and it took a while to settle down and I would have to perhaps, you know, apply to a hospital close to wherever he was. So I said, no, you know, you, we have to do something about that. Um, you would decide to do some training, uh, you know, having, but you, you have to decide to leave the Royal Air Force. I can't deal with this moving and, you know, packing up and the, and the baby to take care of. So, so when, he when he was, I, let me ask a question as well. If so I remember as a, a student at grammar school when I associated with Mike in the independence movement, he told me he served in Cyprus where yes. there, there was an independence movement that the Royal Air Force was combating and he also served in Aden, which is in the Middle East. These are the two places he told me he served overseas, is that correct? Yeah, well, I know for sure of Cyprus. Yes. So, because it came home at one time and went back, I think we had married then, and they refused. There was, I think, a war or something going on in Cyprus, and I couldn't hear from him. And yes. of course, I had a small baby. And when I um, tried to get information from the Royal Air Force, where's my husband? He said, we can't give you any information, um, but we can tell you it's okay, and if we have any um, information that we think you should be aware of, we will let you know. They yes, really took care of me as his wife. You know, there was always transport or a car if I had to take the child to the clinic or something like that. Yeah. But were you were mother, you leaving were you living in a government quarters or were you living in your own home at that time? No, at that time there were homes provided for wives of servicemen. I so I was living in yeah in not quarters of such. They were like bungalow houses yes. or houses that you could share. You know, I see. And, and do you remember other West Indians at that time in the Royal Air Force? Apart from Cliff, who was his friend, his, his good friend, his best friend. Uh, and yes, there was a Guyanese as well. 
um, Johnny Ramarika, uh, there was Cliff. And there was this Scottish guy, I can't remember his name now. Uh, those are the ones that I could remember. Okay, so now we, let's 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 go through. Mike is leaving the Royal Air Force. Um, I know he attended. He did industrial engineering. Do you know anything about that? Yes, Tell us about yes. that. At Cheltenham College, it was better for me then because I could continue. I applied um, and got in accepted to do the midwifery uh, about a year, six, nine months after the baby. And by that time, he had also. Um, left the Royal Air Force and has started at the Cheltenham College to do this engineering. So we had to find our own accommodation, which, you know, took some time and a lot of racism. We had the newspaper, we were looking for accommodation. And once they see your face, they said, oh, sorry, the, 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 the apartment was taken. So it took us quite a while. Uh, eventually we got an apartment with a Polish family and um, you know, continue from there. And so he started. So Mike studied um, uh, industrial engineering at Cheltenham College. That's and, right. And when did he complete that? Would that be like 65, 67? 65, 67, thereabout. Yes. And, and you all were living at that time in the London area? No, well, in Cheltenham, in Gloucestershire. Yes, because that was the last posting, Cheltenham, you know. Yeah. Cheltenham Royal Air Force, yeah. uh, Eastern Avenue. Yeah. So, um, do, you have any, do you have any pictures left of uh, yourself and Mike in those days? When he, I remember as a young set of grammar school when I'd come to your home, there was a picture of you and Mike, and he was in his uniform. It used to be somewhere in your drawing room. Yes. I, yeah, yeah, wedding picture. I, but our wedding picture, because of course he got married in uniform. That's it. That's right. That's right. He got married in uniform. You still yes. have that picture? Yes, I do. I, I I'd like you have. to take a copy of that picture so when we make this video, we can introduce some pictures of yourself in England, early days, and we can put it through the film, okay? Yes. That's one and there's this particular picture when Rosie was in Canada and in the Black Power Movement, he had sent um, Mike lots of, you know, clippings and stuff like that. So Mike, I could, you know, visualize and, and, and internalize that Mike was, you know, really talking about act, becoming an activist. So uh, stop right there, because this is very important because uh, Justice Irvin Andre has almost completed the biography of Rosie Douglas, of course, which touches on Mike. So you were saying to me that when, when you were with Mike in the Royal Air Force, you were a nurse, Rosie was sending correspondence to Mike, newspaper clippings about the Black Power. So you're saying that Mike himself has started to change. That's right. Yes. yes Tell yes. us about that. Uh, well, the, the first time I saw Mike gave a, a speech, it was at the Gloucestershire Town Council, as we would say. Like you have, like the you know um, credit union, yeah. uh, you know council, and it was on Black Power. Interesting. And Yes, he had, that was when I saw the first contingent of what we'd say Caribbean, West Indians. I see. And then white. And, you know, I, it really struck me. I was really proud of him. Yes. How, uh, how, how would you rate Mike as a speaker? And why would you say he was so eloquent and well-spoken? Because he rose to the rank of corporal in the Royal Air Force, and he was given a lot of responsibility. And of course, he too have encountered racism. And I think he had a good educational background. He even from Dominica, primarily. He had the best in writing that even now that I've ever come across. Yes. And, and therefore, I think all of that was in his upbringing, his father. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. It's funny that you said that because I was going through my papers and I found some handwriting, very good handwriting during the independence movement. And I think that might be Mike, Mike's handwriting. So I'll take a picture of it and send to you. So you can let me know whether that is in fact Mike's handwriting. I have it right here in my, in my office here. Yes. So soon, soon after his speech, there was this um, election uh, for... Uh, People, members from the community, they were trying to form a, a council 
And I, I can't remember how I was introduced into it, but I know I was selected among the counselors. I have a picture of it, which I will um, show you. And you know, you still have this rosette and I think yeah. I must have been the only person of color at the time. But I was proud because this black power thing he was talking about and what I was facing in the nursing profession made me become very conscious. So were you, did you face any racism you'd say in the nursing profession? Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh, yes. Okay. But Jamaicans were very good for themselves. And as Jamaicans, we used to be, we stick together. Yes. You know? So you yes. have a kind of a, um, a support system. Yes, indeed, so yes, indeed. Say something unkindly to you. And Jamaicans who had rose to the rank of uh, nursing tutors. Yes. yes. So they would make sure that, you know, my sister wasn't at the hospital at the time. She had moved on to another hospital. But there was this girl, I think her name was Burke. That was her last name, but we used to call her Burke. And she was a tutor and she would make sure that all of us West Indians, you know, were not abused, so to speak. Yes. It's interesting you say this because I had uh, most of my mother's, all my mother's brothers, went to England, two became miners in uh, the National Union of Mine Workers with led by Arthur Cargill, and became a construction engineer. They were in Nottingham. And they were always saying that the Jamaicans, you know, they, they, the Jamaicans were like bigger brothers uh, uh, to them because the Jamaicans, I guess, were more nationalistic and, as we said, stuck together. So the Jamaicans in England sort of took care of the smaller islanders in, in many respects, and they had a very high opinion of Jamaica. And of course, many, of them, many of them married to Jamaicans as a result of that. No? I would just like to bit in too. I think as children growing up, a spiritual background is very important because there's a certain when you when in England I can remember respect. Uh, you know, for people who probably you don't like but are older than you, and to be polite, it doesn't matter who the person is, and not an eye for an eye, so to speak, but be humble enough to learn from whatever it is that you may have come up against. And I think that served me very well. Yes, very well. outstanding. Yes. So let's, we're coming now to Dominica now, because you're getting ready to leave for Dominica. Yes. Um, when did you decide to, when did Mike decide to go back home? Right, well, I wanted to go to Africa because it was, we met African um, nurses and you know, other young people of our age from people like Nigeria and you hear so much about Africa and you learn so much when you were in school and things like that. So that was where I wanted it. That was why I also encouraged Mike to leave the Royal Air Force. We could go to Africa, um, you know, and I, I've seen or uh, met nurses who have gone to Africa and, and I've done very well. But his father came to England and spoke to him and said, one of the things Mike told me, his father said that he needed help and in, in, in not staying in England and saying, and it's time that he returned. But I took all of that with a pinch of salt. I said, you know, when you really see that I'm determined and I would like to travel further. But the late Maynard, Yes. Charles Maynard, because Ian is named Ian Charles yes. after Charles. Uh, came, he was he was studying law, I think, at Aberystwyth. Yes. Yeah. Upon his graduation, he invited Mike and myself as his guests. Yes. And there somewhere I can overheard the conversation because he was then preparing to return to Dominica because he had completed his studies. And he was saying that, you know, your father needed you. I think I kind of heard that bit. Yeah. And that you should really think of, of, you know, coming back with your family. That was it. But on his return, he wrote Mike a letter to say that RBD needed you. So I think at that stage, I said, okay, you know, well, I will decide it, we'll go back. I was that, disappointed because my heart was set on going. At that time, yeah. you only had one child, that's Robert. 
That's Robert, yes. yes. Robert was about five. Okay, so when did you return to Dominica? We returned to Dominica in July, July 6, um, 1969. Okay. On and, a banana uh, boat. On from, a banana boat. Yes, from Amsterdam. Amazing. So did yeah. you bring home your furniture and your car and all of that with you? Yeah, there was a car. Uh, the furniture, not much furniture, you know, mainly household things were shipped before. Yes. So what kind of car did Mike come back to Dominica with? I think it was a Subaru. Really? I, Interesting. Yes, yes, a greenish Subaru. <laughs> Interesting. So let me ask you this. What was it like coming to Dominica, having been, grow, having been born in Jamaica? What did, how did Dominica strike you? This, I can tell you that. We, it was 10 days. The boat took 10 days from Amsterdam to Dominica. Now, we were supposed to come directly to Dominica. Somewhere, uh, we were guests of the captain of the boat. The, it was a geese boat. So, at one point, it must be about eight days, uh, the boat anchored. And for whatever reason, I see Mike was looking through a porthole, and but it was dark. And he said to me, come and see. So I looked and I said, I can't see anything. He said, yes, I live over there. I said, there where? Because <laughs> all I could see was fireflies. <laughs> and my heart was beating, oh. <laughs> However, <laughs> I said, no, Mike, we've gone to the wrong place. He said, no, it's not the wrong place. I live there. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I ate breakfast. I don't know how I dressed because I keep looking and I couldn't see anywhere that people lived. <laughs> <laughs> was it nighttime or daytime? <laughs> I think it was, was dawn. It was dawn. maybe about five, six o'clock in the morning. Yes, yes, yes. However, we were supposed to disembark at about 10, 10, 11. Yes. By that time, I arrived in a Twiggy outfit. Yes. A Twiggy and a boxer hat. Okay. With my all dressed up and held tightly. A and Twiggy uh, outfit, is that a dress or is that a, a, a pantsuit? A, no, it's not a pantsuit. It's a skirt, it's a suit, but a yes. skirt, not a pants. Okay. <laughs> right. I, 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 I can't remember the color now. Checkered, I think it was. Yes. And alongside the geese boat came these lighters. Yes. And there was this guy, um, Stafford Sabine. Yes. He was beaming and he came and he, you know, to help me to go down. And <laughs> <laughs> you're afraid that because a lighter is a small boat that yes. comes next to the big boat. And then you have to step into the small boat, right? That's right. So it's very dangerous. And I've never done anything like that in my whole life. However, when I arrived on the, on the wharf, there was a huge lineup of young people, young girls in green skirt and white blouse. They were, from, they were from the snacket to form a guard of honor. <laughs> oh my goodness. So that was from the um, RBD snacket yes. because RBD had a snacket in Portsmouth. That's right. Just so people understand, when I was a child, my father was in charge of the Portsmouth Plaza in those days. And RBD had the only hotel, the guest house. So he had the, he had a supermarket, he had a little restaurant, and he had a cinema. The cinema may have come later. So you were saying to me that RBD arranged for a guard of honor of girls from his um, business, the Snacket, to lie in the wharf. That's, Tell yes. us about that. Yes, so there they were. And I, I was in a state of shock, I would say. But going along with the, you know, the thing, I'm home now, and I keep telling myself, you know, you're here now. You have to try and see, you have to make the best of it. And, and just, so, just so that your listeners understand, the Douglas family was the most prominent family in Portsmouth at that time. Correct. Correct. And, and why were they prominent? Can you explain? Um, in my view, having arrived in the Snacket 
of course, I was shown to the, the next home, which was uh, on the other street. And of course, lunch was prepared. And of course, everybody was dressed up in their uniform to serve lunch. And I'm not sure whether I was still in shock. I was hot. I want to get rid of all this clothes on me. And my little boy, you know, it was terrible. I, I didn't even know where Mike had disappeared to because all the guys, you know, were singing. However, after lunch, that's about one or two o'clock, I thought. Do, do you remember what you had for lunch? Do you remember what he had for lunch? <laughs> no, I can't remember now. I know macaroni and cheese was <laughs> among the ingredients. <laughs> so I thought someone would say, you know, well, get changed, get shower, and have a rest. But no, RBD came and said, you have to take a tour of Portsmouth. I'm not sure if I wanted to cry or wanted to go. You have the certain people who you must meet today, namely Amazing. the Johnsons, the Greens, uh, my Green, of course, his sister, um, the Johnsons, the Michelles. These were what you call the distinguished families of Portsmouth. Right, escorted by RBD from house to house. Were you when driving the car or are you walking? Walking on Bay Street. <laughs> Got back home maybe about five o'clock and I just passed out in the sitting room. You know, there's a settee there and I just fell asleep. Yes, yes. So that was your first day. That was your first day in Dominica. Yes, and, and I was I really didn't like it. I really didn't like it. Two days down the line, he said, Mike said to me, you have to come and see Hamsty. I've never seen these abolos. Before. Yes, a big, a big, a big, a big, and we got to Hampstead. Yes, yes, yes. I run about all the places. Yes, yes. I fainted twice on that day. Oh, Literally boy. fainted at Hampstead because they told me there were snakes. I would never snore snakes apart from the zoo in London. Yes. So, you know, when I got back, I told my mother in law, I think at some point I would like to go back to England. <laughs> she just look at me and smile and shake her head you know but tears were in my eyes and, and that's you talking she, about your mother-in-law Bernadette Douglas that's right yes and, and when you said Hampstead the Hampstead was a family estate where they had bananas and coconuts and so on correct correct now I, I saw a lot of little boys between the age of say six and 10, they used to bathe on the jetty and they were absolutely naked, no clothes. They used to jump off the jetty. Yeah, yeah. And some of them had all ulcers all over them and mosquito bites. Yes, you know? yes, yes. I said to myself, no, I can't live here. Yes. However, this gentleman, who I correspond with in terms of applying for nursing, because I was a nurse and I, I wanted to go work at the hospital, came to see me at the Snacket, Dr. Dorian Schillingford. Yeah. And he said, um, would you like to come and see the hospital? Yes. Yeah. So I said, yes, I, I get out. You know, it was a fresh, thought and ideas apart from my family that was surrounding me all the time. So I went to Portsmouth Hospital then. And honestly, I said, no, 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 no. I can't work here. I, I cannot stay. I want to go back to England. I made my mind up at that time. Why did you say that? <laughs> because you see the training in England and, and, and what I saw, the way, you know, people was being attended to and, you know, things like that was so foreign to me, I think, you know, the, the courtesy and the empathy and, and things like that, you know, mothers were crying as well as babies. However, when I got back to the snacket, maybe a week or so, because that was July, August, I... I, I'm sure I didn't want to work in the snacket. But having a discussion with my father-in-law, RBD at the time, I told him of my decision that I would work at the hospital. I'm not going. He said, no, you're not going to that hospital to work. I said, yes, sir, I am going. 
He said, no, your business, your place is right here in this business. I said, I was trained as a nurse and as a nurse, I'm going up there to eat. He said, you know something? You're going to throw bache and dress bobo. So mm. I looked at him and I said, excuse me, sir. I was trained to throw bache and dress bobo. I did it for the white people in England. I can do it for my own people right here in Dominica. I'm going to work as a staff nurse. I'm not your son's wallflower. Oh boy, that's a very strong woman. That's a very strong woman. I'm proud of you. <laughs> that, that's amazing. Yeah. He, he wasn't very pleased and I felt I was a bit bold, but he left and with tears in my eyes, I called my sister in England and she said, well, if you don't like it and you want to come back, I'll send you the ticket. <laughs> but you're going to be a nurse you are and a nurse you will be. <laughs> so when did you join the nursing service in Portsmouth? On the 22nd of September, that very year. Yeah. I went there, no uniform, no nothing. I was given a theatre gown. Amazing. I, yes, I, I done a theatre gown and, and there were so many things to do. So many, right now... Um, How many beds were there at the hospital in those days? 26. Yeah. yeah. 26. Was, and there was, was there an operating theatre? Yes, there was an operating theatre. And most of the time, I was the, the surgeon's assistant. I see. And who was the surgeon in that time? Um, Dr. There was an Indian guy, Dr. Ramdas. Dr. Ramdas. Yes, Dr. Was Ramdas. Was he an Indian from India or was he an Indian from the West Indies? He was an Indian from from Guyana, he was a Guyanese. I see. A okay. Guyanese Indian. Uh, but I think he was training in England or maybe in the Caribbean. But yes. that was the first doctor that I worked with here. Yes. I and see. then of course came Dr. Hendrix Paul. Yes. Right. Uh, and I worked very you know well and hard with Dr. Paul because he was the doctor here during Hurricane David. Yes, and he was the, of course, he was one of the early Dominican surgeons after Dr. McIntyre. Yes, yes, yes. yes. that's right. Yes, yes, yes. So, and so, so, so how is that? Yes, indeed. So, um, tell me about the news of Rusey's involvement in the Sir George William University uprising. How did that news come to you all in Dominica? That was in 1969, I think, February? 69 February? Yes. Well, we weren't back until July 69. So that must have taken place already. Yes, yes. But yes. I know my father-in-law wasn't very happy at all. I think I came in at the point where he was negotiating for Jenna Amo, who was a lawyer at the time, to go to to Canada to represent Rosie. Yes. I think that stage I came in. Yes. At that time, what was the, what was his what was uh, Mike's feeling about what Rosie had gotten himself involved in in this black power movement? Well, from what I, I I can remember, I gather that Mike was very supportive of Rosie, um, yeah. but very wary of RBD. And RBD at one stage think these boys of uh, did not accomplish what he RBD wanted them to accomplish. Mike was supposed to have gone to England because he was truant and he needed to go and learn the hard way. And Rosie was sent to Canada to do agriculture. Yeah. So, you know, with this, I know he was a bit disappointed because in the end we struck a really good friendship between RBD and myself, especially at the time when, you know, uh, he, he realized that I'd really settled down and I was, you know, adamant and being who I was supposed to be a nurse at the hospital. Tell and, for Dominicans who do not remember him because he passed away more than 30 years ago. Yes. Tell us what um, RBD, how, what, how, what was RBD, how was RBD, what, was he, what were his characteristics as well as Bernadette Douglas' his wife? I find my mother-in-law was very docile, very humble, very... I think she would forgive any and everybody. 
Um, she loved the community. She loved the McGlaw family and made sure that I meet all of them. But my father-in-law was very protective and he went out of his way to make sure that I was happy, to make sure that I didn't go to Roseau to work. Anything that I needed from gas for, this, for the cooking, you know, for stove, to if Mike wasn't there, to make sure that there was somebody to make sure that I was safe at the whole, you know, there were several men who used to work for him that he trusted and, and things like that. And he was very um, domineering, I think, wanted to have his own way rather than listening to what you are saying. He would have already made up his mind what is going to happen. So yeah. you have to have your story straight. Yes. And I find he was a bit too strict and hard with the children, in particular the boys. Yes. But Eisenhower, I find, used to give him a run for his money. You know, he'd say yes and do the opposite. And of ah. course, why would he get hold of him? He'd have a good beating. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the opening of the RBD cinema, which was the first cinema outside Roseau in North American history. It's in the 70s. I can't remember a lot about the opening of the cinema. Because I think at that time I was really engrossed with nursing and, um, and, and the nursing association. I'm not sure if during that time, if it opened at a time when I wasn't there, because I represented Dominica, the Nurses Association conference in Bermuda. So I think the, the cinema was opened around about that time, 70s, 72. Yes. 70. So I can't remember. Two, around that time, yes. Yeah. Let me ask you then about Mike's involvement in politics and how that impacted you. Uh, that was a very turbulent time, too. Um, but I used to support Mike in anything that he said. He would always, you know, make sure that I see the, the standpoint from which he's coming. I can remember at one time when he and Patrick John had some fallout. And I think Patrick must have dismissed him from the Labour Party. That's so in 1977. That's in 1977. And I, I didn't know how to handle it. But I was really involved with the nuns. They really took me under my, their wings. They look out for me. They made sure, you know, they were really the ICM sister. And there was this sister, I went to her and uh, there was a lot of things, you know, going on, Miss Charles, and a lot of political wrangling. So when I went to her and I told her, I just heard it on the radio that the premier has dismissed Mike from the party. So she said, come with me. And there was this little chapel in the convent. And she said, kneel down and pray. So I stayed there for a while and, you know, the anxiety and everything of not knowing what's going to come next. And I prayed. And then after that, um, she had prepared a meal. So, and then after that, she said, come to her room, which is a room with just a single bed and a little table. And she said, now you have a rest. Yes, that's so, nice. I think I would only see Mike for a short period. Mike would be with Tony Astapan and... Uh, well, that's much later after the, um, the Charles came to power. But let me go back a little bit. Mike ran for his first election, and that would have been in 1975 in Portsmouth. Okay. That's when he became a Minister of Communication and Works. Yeah. Tell us how that first election went and whether how did he discuss it with you? Well, what I can remember in that first election was in a motorcade um, through from maybe from the Indian River to, to the um, Benjamin's Park. Yes, yes. Um, I wasn't so much involved vocally. Yes. You know, uh, I was more focused on the hospital and what was going on there. By so that time, you were the senior, you were the most trained nurse at that time. You know? Right, yes, yes. So yes. did you become the chief nurse, the staff nurse at that time? Yes, I from staff nurse, I rose to ward sister. 
and from then to be departmental sister. Yes. And, yes. and therefore, and you have a, a, a cadre of personnel to deal with who, you know, training was so different, different from what I was accustomed. Yes. And most of them seen me coming in with a different mindset, which, you know, you, yes. you're spending too much time or you're giving too much time or too much air, but the need was there for that. Let and me ask I, you. Uh -huh. Let me ask you, what were the main, before we get into the politics, what were the main medical conditions or the conditions, as you say, in medicine that were endemic in the mm -hmm. town of Portsmouth? Yes, medical conditions were, uh, we had a pharmacy, of course, and just one medical doctor who had to do the complete health district. Uh, there were a lot of what we call yours, a lot of malnutrition. Tell us, what your, tell us what yours, so that for persons who don't know, what is, what is yours? What is yours were ulcers, skin ulcers, which would eventually penetrate into muscles and very difficult to treat. Um, what, was the, what was the genesis of yours? Was, is it a bacterial disease or bacterial it, infection? Or what? Bacterial infection, yes. Um, and this yours, in my opinion, was coupled with several organisms, bacterial organisms, because they weren't really treated properly. Yeah. And then there was the advent of penicillin. Yes. And all of these little children, they, they had no shoes and, you know, wingworm, as they would call it, yes. uh, viruses that would, uh, you know, cause itching and from the itching and the mosquito bites you would get a lot of bacterial infection you know secondary infections yes yes so so um the advent of penicillin led to the diminution or the decrease of that um disease it literally eradicate this yours i would say yes yes other mm -hmm. than yours what were the conditions that were prevalent in portsmouth conditions for women worm infestation and anemia because of course the worms would live in the intestines and you know other parts of the the, the body and they, they live on you know you get anemia because they live on the blood and was that because a lot of people walked around without shoes so that the eggs would penetrate through the soles of the feet very much so yes very much so yeah did there were no shoes the little children used to go around barefooted you yes. wouldn't see children with shoes Maybe yeah. even going to school, there were no dead children barefooted. And there was no mosquito apart from, there was no mosquito coil. Yes. And I can't even remember what they used to treat mosquito because when my own child was bitten badly by the mosquitoes and the then Dr. Sorendo who was in Roseau and his wife was a Jamaican. So we became very good friends. He wrote me a prescription for mosquito repellent, which I yeah. couldn't get in Dominica. Amazing. Eventually, Amazing. Yes. Eventually, I think someone sent me some from Barbados, which didn't, you know, last very long. And he got secondary infection from scratching. That's right. So tell us about the birth of your other children, because you have Robert, who is an architect, but you also have Ian and Akeem. Yes. Well, Robert, um, after Hurricane David, um, after Hurricane David and Robert was there and you know the schools and things were very, very difficult during that time. And I was very much engaged with the hospitals and you know things like that, organization and management. So I spoke to my sister at the opportunity when we were able, uh, communication became, you know, uh, I was able to make communication. Um, and she said, okay, well, send Robert back because he was born in England. So you should, if you can get a, get his passport uh, and maybe get somehow figure it out from your end and then let me know what happened. Judith Pestina was my very good friend um, because they, you know, there's so many things in between. I chaperoned Judith and Aflin. They were in high school at the time. Anyway, they 
they, they asked RBD for them to have some kind of uh, activity at Hampstead. And RBD said no, unless there was someone to chaperone them and the house, they couldn't go. So Athlin asked me and I volunteered. And you didn't know, they eventually locked me in a room when I got there. <laughs> <laughs> and only allowed me out the morning because I had to go to work. Oh my goodness, uh, oh my goodness. But bottom line is, um, Robert went to school in England to yes. study. Yes, after the hurricane, you had the British ambassador, the British people were here, uh, seeing, you know, British people who needed assistance. And Judith made sure, she was in the ministry at the time, she made sure that I got in and spoke to the gentleman responsible. And then I had to produce his passport and everything. She took care of it. And so Robert went back to England. Yeah. Um, what about Ian yeah. and how, when was Ian born? Ian was born in December 6, 1970. Okay. So, so then Patricia Douglas, who, who was a nun, she's since passed away, may her soul rest in peace. She decided to take um, one child of, of, a, of each of her siblings. That was one of Mike, one of Rosie who was Debbie and one of Tingale, I think it was Sigmund. And she would take them to the convent with her in Grenada. So Ian went to Grenada and Hakim remained with us. Yes, when was Hakim born? Hakim was born on the 16th of December, 1973. Yes, yes indeed, yes indeed. I remember Akeem and Ian, of course, being uh, little children when I would come to the home. Very nice. So, so Mike yes. was up for election. Why do you think Mike was popular and was able to win that election in Portsmouth in 75? Because of his mother, I would think. You know, his mother, and of course I came, you know, the role I would play at the hospital and, you know, who I was with the people and then the people themselves. I can remember at one time they used to call me the little angel, you yes. know, how you respond to their needs and they see that as, you know, Mike is here and, you know, there's Olive and, you know, they appreciate um, the the service that I was doing. And of course the mother was, you know, she, her life and so was the community people and the community of Portsmouth. Outstanding. So, I, so yeah. you're saying there's a combination of his mother's votes because of her charitable works mm -hmm. and your votes because of your work in medicine and nursing, you oh, created yeah. an enabling environment for Mike to thrive. Yeah, and, right. But did he have his own charisma and his own power of speech? Yes, I think so, because, um, you know, growing up, this the rigid kind of, what I would say, training or, or parenting was so hard, all these beatings and how they had to work hard and the people on the estate, how they used to work very hard as well. Um, I think, you know, he wanted to bring a change to that environment and to the community, that um, beatings and things like that should be thing of the past and yeah. did not really achieve much hostility and anger in young people. That's so right. I, I think, you know, he had that through his own experience and yes. also his experience in England, you know, and that they could be anything that they wanted to be if they had given the opportunity and the environment in which to bloom, I would say. Okay, so let's go to Rosie Douglas. Rosie returns in 1976. Mike is a minister of government um, and he's living with his older brother in your home. Tell us about that. How was, what was that like? Yeah, well, I found Rosie to be really, you know, uh, what did I say, gay? And he was, he just would get the little, the young people at his fingertips, he was full of stories. But I could read behind Rosie that there was other serious things that he had to do. Um, I think he gave me his book, Change or Chain. 
I think was the book. And you know, that would give you some idea without sitting down and telling you what you're doing. But when he arrived here, I remember his first meeting was at the market. I did not attend it because um, now, I said the children are at home and Mike was there and th th at home I was supposed to be. Um, but that I think that first meeting in the market had really set the tone. And Rosie, at, when he came home uh, and the next couple of days, I could feel that he had gotten across to members of the community what he really, the changes that he really wanted to bring about, not only in Dominica, in Portsmouth, but in Dominica and in the region. Because in discussion, Rosie said to me that, you know, that the Caribbean has to stand together, uh, whether you're Jamaicans, but he would start with places like St. Kitts and Grenada and St. Vincent, bring these together first, and then you you know get on board Jamaica and, and things like that. So, so Mike I, was so Mike was a great regionalist. He believed in one Caribbean, at least the English speaking Caribbean. Rosie, yes, that was that was what he was set out to do. The yes. regional integration. You didn't see it until after. I really began to see it. When Rosie had invited me to Tripoli for this 50th anniversary, and, and that's another long story, because uh, my, and my brother, who was ill at the time in England, my eldest brother, um, I left here to visit my brother in England, but really ended up in Tripoli. And um, when you say Tripoli, you mean Tripoli, Libya? In Libya, yes. Where, where, yes, where yes. the president at the time was Muammar Gaddafi. Yes, yes, and, and, and there was this huge celebration. And, and Ruzi, Ruzi at that time I, was working closely with Muammar Gaddafi on African liberation. Yes, yes. Most of it I didn't know until when I got to um, Libya. Tell me because, what you saw in Libya. Tell me what you saw. What I saw was the, the celebration was just outstanding. And, and the place where Gaddafi stood, you know, was all decked out in flowers. Beautiful. It was like a flower garden. And the carpet on which we were seated was, was soft, was like cushion. His bodyguards close to him were women, long hair and long guns. The guns were as long as their hair, their hair flowing down. Um, he was wet, and the cars and the, the motorcade, you know, it just blew my mind. Uh, and then the reception was where, there were several receptions. The first was on a, on a British boat, a British um, tourist boat, so to speak. But there, the, the music people on that boat were from Dominica. Amazing. So yes. Rosie, Rosie brought Dominican musicians to Libya. Yeah, and I only knew that on the boat because some of them said, nurse, you are here. They could say, you know, how did they arrive here? And at that time, because they were, the, the guests were people from England and America. And, uh, you know, of course, I didn't see them again after that. It was a fantastic night and you were allowed to meet. And, and people were like, um, the president at the time from Panama yeah. and from other region in Africa. I can't remember them, but I can remember um, meeting them. Momo Gaddafi, I, I met. And what is the other one now? He was later on um, imprisoned in the United States. Was that Charles Taylor? No, not Charles Taylor. He was from Panam Panama? Noriega. Oh, Nor Nor Noriega, Noriega. Yes, right, yes, yes, yes. He was one of those that I met as well. So, so Rusi was the organizer of all of this? Yes, 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 yes. Be because he was the executive director of World Mataba. In yes, Libya. I can remember when they had this huge reception. I can't remember where it was. And you know, he held me tightly, we were going through. Then he said, ask someone to take care of me, and he disappeared. And yeah. the next time I heard him was on the microphone. Yes, yeah. yes. So, yeah. so Rosie, Rosie was the orchestrator of this global gathering. 
Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Very much so. Yes. Let's talk about then Dominica getting independence in 78. And then, of course, the change of government and Mike becoming the minister again. If you, what, what your recollections are of that? Yes, my recollection of that was um, in 78, the reception for Princess Margaret at Windsor Park. Yeah. It was. And the, when they were, the, the, the flag, the Dominica, the British flag was lowered and the Dominican flag was hoisted. I was sitting almost next to Princess Margaret. And that too was quite memorable because, um, you know, Patrick Don took over after that. That's yes. my collection. So, you know, I know the time is coming to an end, but I want to go into Rusi's ascension to office as prime minister in uh, February of 2000. Tell yes. us about that. But, but before I do that, let me talk about uh, the departure of our dear beloved friend and your beloved husband, Mike. I believe that was in 1992. Uh, how did you know that he was ailing? And, and, and tell us about his departure. Um, well, it, let me see now. Mike, at one stage, was in Puerto Rico. He had gone on some official business. And he did not quite accomplish what he went to do. But because he called me and said, Olivia, Olive, he used to call me Pusika, I am not feeling well. It looks as though I ate something the night before uh, supper. And since that, I am not feeling well. I said, well, try check the pharmacy and see in Puerto Rico, get something for that stomachache. The next day he said, as though I'm feeling worse. So I said, well, Mike, you'd better come home. Um, and then maybe a couple hours or so passed and he called me and he said he would be on the next flight. Um, would I come and receive him, come to pick him up at the airport? For whatever reason, I got quite a bit, I got a bit nervous and I called Nathan Barnes and I said, Nathan, I don't think I can drive to the airport, but would you, would you please come and drive for me? So he said, yes, no problem, I'll be there. So we went to collect Mike and I observed him coming off the aircraft and he looked very pale. So he came and drove back to Portsmouth. I got the doctor then, uh, he was from Belgium. He was doing, uh, he was here at the time. I can't quite remember his name now. I have pictures of him. And he, I called him and he came and he gave Mike some sedatives. And Mike slept and, you know, things like that. And he, a couple of x-rays he ordered for Mike. And uh, I think x-rayed and then, uh, what is this thing now? He had to have a, I guess, Pedipastic gastrectomy, not gastrectomy, a tube into his stomach. So we went and it was in February, February. But before that, I wasn't um, happy with that. And Dr. Jennifer yeah. eh? Elwin, Dr. Elwin, Dr. Elwin and I was very good friend. So I called Dr. Elwin and I said, I really don't like what is happening with Mike. So she said, okay, she made an appointment for him to, for her to see him. And I was at the nursing school at that time. And uh, she saw him after he was referred, no, he was referred, yes, by the doctor to Dr. Elwin. And Dr. Elwin called me and said that um, from the report, she did not like what was happening. Um, he, he didn't have fever. He didn't have any pain. So there is something else that is going on. Um, she would like to refer him to Martinique or to Barbados, but preferably Martinique, preferably Martinique. So I, I mentioned to Mike what Dr. Elwin had said, uh, but before that, <laughs> when I referred him to see her, 
he said, um, he, he was a bit hesitant. However, he went and he came back and he said, why you didn't tell me you had such a pretty doctor <laughs> working in Russo? I said, I didn't send you there to go and look at the doctor. I went for you and for consultation. He said, okay, but I can make a break for Mac, my brother. <laughs> So anyway, she called me up and she said she didn't like what she saw. So he said, he told her, I'm not going to Martinique. I don't speak French and I speak English and my sister lives in Barbados. So I could stay with her and Joyce would take care of me if there's the need for it. So he decided to go to Barbados. So he went to Barbados and... Um, and he was seen. What happened now? I can't remember. I got the, he sent me the report. He sent me the report. I think he was in Bavi. However, I was sitting in the sitting room there in the chair and he was, he was still in Barbados and he was saying to me, now, tell me what is in the report. Or oh, he was reading the report, yes, from Barbados to me uh, on the phone. And when he came to the part of the report which says it was malignant and cancerous, I just couldn't answer. And he said, I'm not hearing you. And you know, he was irritated at the time. So I just took up some courage and I said, Mike, it looks as though there's, you know, the doctor suspects um, cancer somewhere. He said, suspect cancer or is it cancer? So at that time I said, but Mike, you shouldn't open the letter. It wasn't addressed to you. It was addressed to Dr. Elwin. So you shouldn't. He said, but it's about me and I have a right to know what is in it. But in the background, I could hear Joy screaming. Mm. <laughs> then he arrived, and by that time, Monty and so, you know, the news had passed on, and Monty had made all the necessary arrangements for him to go up to Stone Scattering. Yes, and yes. Um, having arrived there, when we got to the airport, when he came back and we went to pick him up from Barbados, Ian had to drive. And <laughs> You know, it was, he, he said to me, did you tell the boys? And I said, no. He said, okay, I'll tell them. And you know, that, that's the first time now Ian is hearing what was happening. So you could just imagine yes, what was yes. happening at that time. Well, you know, that, that was a sad time for all of us. I, I remember speaking to him, as I said, when he was at, um, in New York at Sloan Kettering and sending him that uh, basket of fruit. I just started working as a lawyer maybe one year, going on two. And um, just over COVID, I was able to recoup, recover the uh, VHS and I digitalized it of his interview with Lennox Linton and it's on um, YouTube. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but what I'll do is I'll send it to um, Sean and Sean can show it to you on the computer. Yes. yes, indeed. Let's talk about then Rusey. Well, you know, we remember Mike fondly and then Mike moved on. And of course I know uh, I was not there, but my father was there. My father represented all of us at that funeral uh, in the fourth passage. Uh, it was quite memorable. And it reflected the love of the people of Dominica for Mike Douglas, uh, dearly beloved friend. And then Rusey becomes prime minister, and you are there with Rusey. And of course, we bring Rusey up to the United States, to the University of New Orleans, and he comes up again in May, and then he comes back in September and goes home and you know, after this great effort passes away suddenly, how did you get the news of Rosie's passing? Yes, um, you know, we were all excited for Rosie and all putting all our support behind Rosie. And it was good, but Rosie, in my opinion, were working, but you couldn't say anything to Rosie. Several community members came here and told me, nurse, you must do something about Rosie. We don't like the way Rosie's looking. But I know Rosie and I said, that's Rosie. I spoke to him about it, but he just brushed it off. He said he was okay. Now the morning, this morning, it was a Sunday morning and I was at mass. I never forget that because that was a very Sunday that I was um, commissioned as a lay associate uh, in this community. 
So there, while I was... And, and by that time, this, you're, you're no longer a Baptist, you're a little Catholic, you're now Catholic. Oh, I became a Catholic. Maybe in the December, I came here in July and December, Mrs. Green, who was uh, my aunt and RBD, they wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> so you didn't have a say in it. You had to become a Catholic whether you like it or not. And my dear friend, Father Shoe, who was very supportive, and the nuns. So, you know, from that point of view, there were people who cared about me and cared for me and care about my well being and things like that. So I was happy to be, you know, tutored and, you know, cared for and mentored by them. So while I was being commissioned, I saw Rose's helper coming in the church towards the altar. And I said, but what is Judith dressed like that, you know? And she made signal to me and I- You mean she was not dressed properly? No, she was in her, you know, or ordinary clothes, not a Sunday clothes for coming to church. Yes. So when I went to her, she said, I rose, he's lying on the floor and I think he's dead. I said, what are you talking about? Nonsense. I think Father Martin was the presider at the time. So I ran back and I said, Father, J Judith has just told me something. I can't make sense of it. I will go and see. And I ran out of the church, straight down to, the, to see Rosie lying there. And I knew then. Was there anybody else there at the time? Um, at the time, hmm. no, I think a couple of members from the church, Beatrice Green, and maybe one or two others who came down, ran behind me when they saw I ran out of the church towards yeah. Rose's house. But I can't know. It was, I can't recall who was there. The whole thing was happening so fast. Yes. And so were you, what did you do? You took his pulse or? Yes. And, you know, I, of course, like a nurse, put my head down to listen. There was no breathing or anything like that. Um, so I then called, there's about, three people I called. I called Miss Wallace, who was my good friend. And I said to her, I think Rosie has died. And then I called, what was the next person? But you I didn't, do any, you didn't do any CPR or anything like that? There's no? No, 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 no I didn't. Um, once, was that because you thought, you thought it was too late? From my nursing experience, I know Rosie had died. So, right. and, you know, yeah. And from the time that Judith came and so CPR, and when I arrived there, it was too late. Um, I called Washway, who was the next person. I said, Washway, please come and take charge. Come, I need your help. And um, what was the next one? I think the next call was to the police because I realized then that you, you know, and um, I can't remember if then I did call the medical people, but the ambulance came, the ambulance was not, you know, far behind us. So they yes. Well, you know, there's been a lot of controversy about Rosie's death. You know, there are yes. a lot of us who have our suspicions and so on. Any comments on that at all? Yes. I don't know. I, I don't know if I had my suspicion. One, because of the turmoil that was going on in Libya at the time. And I don't, I don't know where Rosie was. If it was in England, I doubt. But I could see him embracing um, Muammar Gaddafi. He was in Libya. He was in Libya that same year, shortly before he died. Right. And I said, you know, and with what was going on on the international scene, I said, boy, Rosie, you're risking your life. I said that to myself. Yes. And so I had, you know, I don't, my own suspicion yes. in, in the work that he was doing. And even when... Even when I traveled with him, myself and Nathan Barnes, to Libya, um, you know, I, I went there and back without my passport, with my passport not being stamped. And the intricacies, he was staying at Grubner House, which is a big, like, hotel in, in the city of London. And that's where myself and Nathan was staying with him. And he would tell you that, you know, so-and-so is coming, go oh, so-and-so, you know, Rosie at Donka, you never know what Rosie's are. We were on the train going to get the, the flight to Libya. 
And he said, when we were on the train, come, we have to leave this car and go into the next car because there's somebody following us. However, he got all the traveling documents for myself and Nathan to travel with him to Libya. On my return to Dominica, um, they, I, I went straight back to work. And of course, as far as I'm concerned, nothing happened. I went to England during my vacation to visit my sick brother and so forth. While I was at the nursing school, the commissioner of police then um, Blanchard <laughs> uh, came to the hostel and request to Miss Brooks, who was the principal, that he would like to speak with me. Of course, I knew him before because he was stationed in Portsmouth. Yes. And I said to him, so what can I do for you? He said, uh, I was reliably informed that you were in Libya. I said, really? And he said, yes, and I would like to see your passport. I said, no, you can't. It's my passport. It's my business. And whoever told you that I was in Libya should have got pictures or whatever. Sorry, yes. I'm not going to give you my passport. What are you going to do? Lock me up? You'd love to have me at the prison, would you? <laughs> <laughs> So he said, okay, um, you know, give me a kind of look as if to say, uh, how dare you defy me? Yes. Uh, he said, okay, I'll be talking to you again. I said, okay, sir. And he left. And I think a day later, a newscaster, this guy, I think he's passed away. I remember his name. He came and he said that he would like to interview me. I can trust him. I said, why are you all are coming about this Libya? Show me some proof where you were sure I was in Libya. Where's the pictures? Where's the, you know, and why should I talk to you anyway? Yes, Who yes. Authority? Mike said, Mike, it's not there. So, you know, I'm not going to say anything to you and I'm not going to give anyone my passport. Yes. It's my passport. It's a British passport. So, yes, yes. Yeah. We talked around thing, and you know, I didn't tell him anything, and he left. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure that just the the British government must have told them. But you know, uh, as we get to the end, and this, you've done an outstanding job. You're well respected all over Dominica, in particular in Portsmouth. After your nursing career ended, you continued working in the community. Um, Call. Tell us about your community work with Calls, and then we will end up with the. Um, new healthcare center that was opened up, I believe, what, uh, March 1st? Would it be March 1st? Yes. Uh, 2021, the Olive Douglas, the Olivia Douglas, the nurse Olivia Douglas uh, Community Health Center. But tell us about calls and then we'll end with that. Well, I would like to, you know, put it on the record here and now that while I was um, selected for that, um, award or, you know, recognition, I must say all the number of people that I worked with in the nursing fraternity, nursing and medical, you know, Dr. Paul, Sister Valerie, Miss Frederick, Miss Brooks, Agatha in Scotland, to name a few. Only this past Tuesday, the first set of nurses that I was involved in training at a, a Zoom, I was really, really surprised and a huge bouquet of flowers. Um, they said, when we heard of this, we had to you know, show our appreciation. We were blessed to have you in our lives and this is the way we could do it. So they're all in America, they're in England and Dominica and you know, Miami. So it was really, really nice. So all of those persons, Dr. Schillingford in particular, Dorian Schillingford, they're very instrumental in the support uh, that brought me to this recognition. Um, it's, I, I, I am humbled. Um, although I never saw anything like this coming, uh, the, even, even my involvement, at, it was very late. But nonetheless, I thought for nursing and for nurses, you know, that I, is my heart. And psychiatric nursing is my bad, my favorite. Um, that I needed to uh, accept graciously. So this I did. 
Uh, because, you, you know, stretch back from when I came here, as I said, the, the nurses, the patients, and uh, there was this lady, she's deceased now, and maybe looking down, we call her Mapatat, I don't know her name to this day, but she used to call me Little Angel, you know, and, and I felt so comfortable working, I could, in the night, when I'm on night duty, and the service that I rendered there, then the opportunity to do nursing education in Barbados, encouraged by Dr. Shillingford uh, at the time and Dr. Ramdas, um, prepared me for, for all of that. Then on my return to Dominica, um, 1980-81, transferred to the nursing school. And that too was, was, you know, was very stressful because I had to travel daily from Portsmouth to Roseau Nursing did you School. Drive your, did you drive yourself? Not at that time, way down, you know, just before Mike died, he bought me a car. Yeah. Uh, and then I started driving. So that's to bring back to that story. After Mike died and I was driving, he bought me, Mike died in April. April, yeah, April, May. He had just bought a, a car for my birthday. I can't remember if it was that birthday or the 50th birthday. However, I felt I couldn't take on the driving. You know, it was just too much driving from Portsmouth to Rosa. So I wrote to the Ministry of Health and asked for a transfer back to Portsmouth. And I was told at the time, I can't remember who the PS is, that they're sorry, they couldn't send me back to Portsmouth because my post was at um, Rosa School of Nursing. And as I said, I know how I felt. So I resigned, I wrote my resignation. And Dr. Paul, who was also my good friend, I said to Dr. Paul, Dr. Paul said, you didn't have to resign. Um, you know, you, you're not well. So I could write to say, I said, but Dr. Paul, I'm not feeling sick. So, and as a nurse, if you're sick, you're sick, but I don't feel sick. So I resigned. And uh, of course, when I became pensionable, I did not get a full pension. I only got 75% of my pension, which now uh, amounts to about $800. Oh, God. <laughs> so, <laughs> So uh, after that, um, I was home. I did Mr. Nassim, um, what's his name? The, Mr. Nassim, Philip no. came to the house, right to this house and said that I heard you're there and you have resigned from nursing. And uh, I said, yes, because I, I couldn't, I had was driving myself and I didn't feel well enough to take on that driving every day. So he said, okay, well, I need someone to do a little bit of management for me of the, the house he has there in, in TB. And I would like it if you decided you would do it. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try, but that's not me, I'm a nurse. So I went, I think about 18 months, I did that. And during that time, during the 18 months coming up towards, I was looking to, I wanted to go back to nursing, but not to travel. So I was home and a nun came to my door and I said, good morning, can I help you? And she said, yes, I'm looking for Miss Olive or Nurse Olive Douglas. <laughs> and I wanted to say to her, she's not living here. <laughs> 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 but I said, no, I couldn't lie to a holy person. So I said, sister, um, this is Olivia, but do come in. I invited her to come in. I said, but sister, I have to change um, and put something more presentable on me. She said, I didn't come to look at your clothes. I come to talk to you about a plan that I have or we've discussed. And someone told me that you'd be one of those persons to be among you know, the, the committee that she's trying to put together. So I got changed and she came in and we discussed Sister Raina Lowe, she was then the director. So she came and we discussed and I was really interested because it's all to do with nursing and all my experience, Jamaica, England, Dominica, would come to bear on these young people 
who we would be dealing with. And therefore, that was how Calls was born. You know, a number of persons were co-opted. Mrs. Andre, who had, was also uh, an uh, educator, was sent to Trinidad to observe the serval training. And on her return, um, Calls was, you know, executed. So what is the acronym called? C-A-L-L-S. What does that stand for? Center where adolescents learn to love and serve. Ah, center where adolescents learn to love and serve. Outstanding. Yes, because um, sister would say, you can't serve if you don't love. And if you love, you will truly serve. I think it's a quotation from Mother Teresa. Yes. So, um, you know, the committee was put together. I think Irvin Schillingford, not Schillingford, no, Irvin Knight was in Portsmouth at the time. Um, there's the young Dr. Serenu's wife, Camille. She yes. was the PRO and secretary. Um, I can't remember myself and sister and a few other community, community persons who was co-opted for the first board. And that was the birth of calls. Yes, outstanding. And you've given great service. So sister, uh, I say sister, you, you, your highest rank uh, in the nursing service was what, uh, Nurse Douglas? What was the highest rank of your thing? Nurse educator at the School of Nursing. Outstanding. Actually, yes, we wrote, there was a, a group, the staff, of the nursing school with Miss Brooks as the principal tutor and Agatha in Scotland, um, Eugenia Corbett, um, Angela Lawrence, um, Fiona Fedrick, Jean Jacob, you know, if I've left out anybody, please. We were the group that put the first ever curriculum together for nursing education in Dominica. Amazing, amazing, outstanding. I just want to say that on behalf of all the people. Just to butt in here a bit, the participation of Dr. Schilling, no, Dr. Schillingford, not a medical doctor, um, who were then transitioning the nursing education from the School of Nursing at the hospital to the Dominica State College. Yes. You know, he was, yes, also, I was privileged to be part of that. Outstanding, outstanding. I just want to, on behalf of the Christian family, you knew my father, you knew my mother, and uh, of course, the members of Mike and Rusey. I want to just, on behalf of all of us, uh, salute you for a life well lived of service to Dominica, service to your patients in England, uh, someone of great love and character. You certainly am exemplify the calls principle. You may not be adolescent, but you, certainly you loved and you served and you served with love. So um, when I got the message, I said, I've got to sit with you. I've got to interview you because you've done so much for us as a country. You've been a true nation builder. And I say that uh, with a lot of love in my heart for you. And I, I know I speak for uh, the majority of our people, overwhelming majority of our people uh, when I say, well done. Well done. May God bless you always and your family and your home and keep you in good comfort and in good stead. You know, and may, may, you, may you live for, for many, many, many more years and, and have a many fantastic, because I know we've only touched the tip of, of, yes. of, of, the, of the subject of your life, but I hope you, uh, the last before time we have an opportunity. Before I finally go, I would just like to say this little bit here that I was. Um, you know, I feel very elated to be um, associated with calls over the past 27 years. Um, I took over the reign as director of calls from 2002 until 2019, when, um, you know, I felt that you needed fresh enthusiasm into it and, and worked with the Canadian sisters who have done a tremendous work uh, and who has even in the latter years have helped to 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 get me more involved internationally um, by sending me to Australia to participate in the uh, 
conference, the, the Presentation Sisters Conference in, in Sydney, Australia, and to this day continue. So now I've passed on the directorship onto the present director is Sister and Sister. What's her name? The, the, the acting sister is Sister Mary Teresa for the director is a new presentation sister, an Indian sister, because the sisters from the province of Canada now is, as it's although it's the same um, congregation, but these are the Indian sisters from India, um, you know, through the, the Canadian sisters, and they had a, a lot to do with calls. And because of Hurricane Maria, lots of the programs that was delivered by calls have, um, we have done a shift focusing a lot more on skills. Um, so we'll see in the, in the next couple of years how calls will you know, continue to develop and shape the lives of young people as we move forward. Well, thank you so much again uh, for giving us some information on calls. We have an NGO, Rebuild Dominica, that has done a lot of work in food preservation uh, classes in Dominica, the grammar school with regard to medical supplies to so the healthcare system. And maybe we can find some way to collaborate with calls because we think, as Rosie thought, that Dominica's future resides in a better relationship with its overseas population. We don't want people to be uh, addressed on the basis of partisanship or political relations. We want them to be addressed on the basis of development work. We want to bring all Dominicans of whatever persuasion, as long as you uh, uh, desire to help Dominica, uh, we want to embrace you and use your scale or your resource network to help local communities, the library. And um, uh, when, when I get offline, I'll talk to you about some books that we've been collecting. We'd like to donate to the schools in Portsmouth so we can continue the process that your mm -hmm. husband and your brother-in-law, Muruzi, started of developing uh, the, 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 not only the Portsmouth community, but the nation as a whole. Um, let me ask you before I go on to the uh, closing remarks, because I'm gonna ask you to maybe send a message to the young people because you've done so much to help young people. Um, how are the medical facilities in Portsmouth now, the hospital and so on? Is that much improved from when you came in 1970, Oh, yeah. before I, I, I reply to your answer, the, the present director of calls is Sister Anne Mary. Yes. Sister Anne Mary. Now, it is greatly improved. They've always been improving over the years, but in the... In this last year, in this last five years, a lot more have been done to make it more comfortable. Uh, the reception area, the casualties, uh, a lot of that has been improved. Um, it's one sad thing they don't do any more surgery like we used to before, like when I first came there. But in terms of um, staff and patient comfort, uh, that has greatly improved. So I there's no like, surgeon in Portsmouth now? There's no doctor? Yes, our present doctor is Dr. I have a name written down. She's from Coolibistri. I see. When, when I think of her name, I'll tell you. Yes, there is a doctor. There's more than one doctor. There is also the collaboration, I think, with Cuban doctors and nurses. Yes. Um, here and and of course our local you know nurses but i can't think of her name right now um she's from salt Ridge, lovely lady so uh, nurse as we close any um final words uh, on uh, your, your children how they are doing and on you know any message to the young people of dominica what you'd like to see them strive for in the memory of your uh, beloved husband your Departed brother in law, and of course, in the memory of your legacy of service. Well, I would like to say that I am blessed with three wonderful, wonderful young men. Um, Robert, you know, I mean, there's no words that I can say for his being here. You know, I, it makes me, it gives me, it added years to my life, um, just knowing that he's there and see to my needs. And of course, Ian, my son in whom I'm well pleased, uh, you know, they're there and Hakim, you know, is just like Mike, you know. So uh, these three boys are very, very good. And I 
one of the things that pleases me, I don't know if it's because of Mike and myself and the way they were brought up, is their community involvement. Whether they're here in Dominica or whether they're out of Dominica in, in, in other parts of the world. But I know that their heart is within their community. Um, so, you know, I'm very happy for that. Ian is very much, is very involved in, in the life of Dominica and in particular Portsmouth. Um, you know, and I am grateful to God for the privilege that I can be around, uh, you know, to, to see him and to support him in, in whatever venture, you know, that their, their turns that their life may take. Um, Ian has gotten married recently, uh, a year, I think, and he himself has, you know, acquired, uh, his wife is quite a community person from what I can see, and hope that she will embrace the community of Portsmouth, and, you know, I'm not going to say work like me, because, uh, you know. <laughs> Nobody can work like you. <laughs> But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, find a rightful place. It's a community and it's a place, it's a community and it's a country. So hopefully that, you know, that will go well for the benefit of the people, for the benefit of the common good. Yes. You know, um, I think that's what God entrusted us here to do. And as someone said, um, you know, when your day comes and you, you go to the great beyond, if you have not carry along with you fellow human beings, then, you know, maybe you, St. Peter might not allow you in. Indeed, so. indeed, indeed. Well, nurse, uh, God bless you, as I said. Um, we salute your uh, splendid efforts. You are still that warm, smiling, beautiful person that I knew when I was at high school, when we first met. And um, I will ask your uh, nephew there, John Douglas, to uh, come along now and say a few words in tribute to you and also ask a few questions of him because uh, his legacy, your legacy is viewed by him as someone growing up in your presence in a way that I think you maybe cannot always appreciate. Sometimes it takes others to tell you about yourself, you know, um, because, you know, we do self-examination, but it's always good to get someone else's opinion. But you wanted to say something before you leave. Yes, one, I would like to mention here my church, yes. my whole life. You know, my spirituality and the growth and maintenance, you know, of several people, um, you know, the, the then Bishop Arnold Bogart, yeah. uh, who, you know, I could go to for counseling and thing was there. Father Charles Martin, Father Thomas, you know, all the, the priests, the FMIs, you know, the amount of support that I get from these people, I could not achieve what I've done without my church, my family church here in Portsmouth and the larger family church of Dominica. You know, I live for that and mm -hmm. I thank them every day for the support that I get and my spirituality. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, again, uh, nurse, always gracious. God bless you always and stay as beautiful as you are inside and outside. God bless you. Thank you. Sean, uh, the handsome fella. Uh, Sean, uh, we've been, uh, we've gone, we've gone a little beyond that we thought, uh, but uh, I, I, any, any comments on, on, on this interview? I learned so much and there's so much more to learn, but of course, you know, we have to, we have to break, up at, break, break up at some point. Any comments on the life that uh, nurses lived, her contributions and, and, and what it represents for the, future generation of nation builders on our island. Well, good afternoon again. Um, I, I thought I knew Anjali very well, but I, I learned, I sat through the interview. I decided to um, suspend my operations, my icing operations, uh, just for a few hours, uh, just to sit down and listen. And um, I've learned a lot, you know, I mean, I have known, there, Gabriel, there are three women who've had uh, a very profound impact on my life. If I have to name three women, who've had this amazing impact on my life would be, would be my mother, of course, Eleanor Douglas, got married to Eddie Lambert, so Eleanor Lambert, Auntie Olive, number two, and uh, this lady, Lena Roach, um, you know, so these three women, and, you know, but Auntie Olive really has um, been like a, a real second mother to me. Um, in fact, when I, I was born in Cheltenham, uh, in the county of Gloucestershire in, in the UK, and um, 
when I was born, Uncle Mike and Aunt Jolie went to the hospital to see me. And the nurse, um, when she saw Uncle Mike, she said, um, congratulations, Mr. Douglas, you, you, um, you have a, a handsome son. No, she did not know that Mike was my uncle and not, and you know, she, she, she thought that Mike was my, was my father. Uh, yes. In fact, Mike is my uncle. And so, in fact, um, my name is Sean Richard Douglas, yes. but Uncle Mike always called me Sean Richard Anthony Douglas. Yes. Um, my birth certificate just says Sean Richard Douglas. Of course, you know, he's Michael Anthony Douglas. Yes, so yes. When I, I mean, you know, back in the, in the 70s, um, actually, there, there was a difficulty really between my, I was living with my, um, with my mother in the family house. And, and your was, mother, your mother, of course, is 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 the sister of Mike and Rosie Douglas. Yes, yeah. So I was living in the family house by with, with granddad in, back in the seventies, and um, my mom and RBD had a had a falling out, and so um, I I left RBD's house and went to live by Uncle Mike and Auntie Olive in Zikak. Yes. Small house, but she welcomed me in, you know, and um, you know I spent a couple of years there until my mom got married in 1976. And then from there I moved to Roseau. But the, the relationship um, endured and even to, to today, you know. So really, you know, um, when I really listen to her life, this, she's had this extraordinary life, really. Her contribution to Portsmouth, uh, to Dominica in the health and the, and the nursing field, enormous contribution. And what to me, I think, really has really struck me today, and of course what I've known for, for decades, is her her love for, for people, her love for community. And, and I think she explained a while ago um, some of the reasons for Mike's dominance in Portsmouth. He, he won the seat four times, uh, 75, 80, 85, 90. And a lot of that was because of, of um, Granny, but because of Auntie Olive. So he had Granny's votes, he had all his votes, his wife. Uh, of course, he had the Labour, the Libla vote, and he had his personal votes. But, but Olive and um, Granny, those two people really, really, I mean, they helped him a lot, Mike, in his, in his, in his political career. But I'm, sure said, I'm really happy that the government decided to uh, recognize her enormous contribution to the Dominica in the medical field over many, many years, from 1970 uh, up until now. Even if she's been working at calls, um, she retired about maybe over 25 years ago, but continue to work in the community really throughout. And I think it's fitting that the government decided to honor her and they're doing the same in other health centers that they have built, health and wellness centers they've built. Um, she certainly is deserving of that accolade and that award. Um, and I think it's an inspiration to young people coming up that, you know, you, 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 yes, you, you, you are born to help yourself and your family, but there's a, a greater a good, a greater good for the community and for the country. And she, her life exemplifies, you know, hard work, dedication and commitment to people. Um, because when, when you look at her life, really, you know, so much of it really has been about helping people uh, sometimes at the expense of her own family because she's had to spend so much time in the hospital when her children were quite young. She had to leave here in 1981 to go to Barbados to do, uh, to, to do further studies in, in, in nursing, came back, served the community. I mean, really, her life is an inspiration to me and indeed an inspiration to all of us in Dominica who feel that, that public service uh, should always be up there. And the Douglas family, when you look at the Douglas family, really, we are a family who've contributed significantly to Portsmouth. And whether it's Mike, Rosie, RBD, um, Uncle Mark is work in the church, Auntie Olive, um, Washer for the Post of Town Council, and of course his work in this foundation, sports. in sports, you know, we, this is a family that has a reputation for philanthropy and for hard work and service, service to people. I remember way back in the early 70s, long before the government was involved, this present government in helping uh, having children's parties at Christmas. Way, way back in the early 70s, I remember Auntie Afflin having children's parties in the main family house, 100 children in the house. Way back, you know. So we are a family of service, and Auntie Olive represents that. She's been in the family for, I mean, since she got married, um, over, what, over, she was married to Uncle Mike for over 30 years. Okay. Yeah, 30 years exactly. In fact, they celebrated their wedding anniversary um, not long before Uncle Mike uh, um, passed. So really, Gabriel, I, you know, I think staying here this morning and listening to Auntie Olive and uh, listening to her life. And, uh, and it's, it's really fortunate because a lot of people, I mean, Auntie Olive, God has blessed her with a long life because sometimes like Uncle Mike, he was, he was cut down in his prime. So was Rosie. Um, luckily, Auntie Olive, God has blessed her with long life. She'll be 80 in April, April the 4th. 
Yeah. I'm glad I'm go she's actually lived long enough to see, to be recognized for her work. Sadly, Mike and Rosie, the Saturday's great revolution, we're not there to see completed, but um, I'm glad that she's still here. And when I listen to her through the interview, she's still as sharp as ever, despite her advancing years, and thank God for that. And, and thank God for you too, Sean, and uh, you're well, you're well, well said. I, if, I can, if I can capture the essence of your uh, uh, remarks, it's to say that like Mike, her husband, her in-laws, her mother-in-law, father-in-law before that, and her brother-in-law, Rusey, and with her own service, and with yours, it was always for the common good and the common wealth. It was never premised on selfishness or personality or vanity. It was always about love and service, which is the essence of calls. So again, I want to thank you, uh, Nurse, uh, as a, being a true nation builder, and Sean for following in her footsteps. You know, they say osmosis is the principle in biology from the higher concentration to the lower. So those of us with lower concentrate of good in us and uh, kindness in us can always benefit from our association with those who are uh, more, let's say, uh, lofty in their ideals, and may it ever be that we not forget you know, the great uh, friends and family members who went before us and who uh, gave, them, gave of themselves, sacrificed of themselves and their family time for the greater good and the commonwealth. And God bless you, nurse. God bless the memory of your husband, Mike, or dear friend, our brother, Ruzi, and certainly Sean, let us work together collectively so we can continue to advance the best of those uh, principles of service to others, so we can build a beloved community in their memory. God bless you all. Thank you very much. I'm going off the record right now. Thank you. Yeah. Just before you leave, the doctor, the present doctor at Portsmouth is Dr. Jeffries. <laughs>